What's going on Flight Sim Crew? This is your pilot in command Ryan and today we do a bit of a uh, cross country, quote unquote cross country, to demonstrate kind of the planning that we go through and some of the stuff that goes into um, any type of flight that starts at your home um, airport and takes you to another airport. So I'm going to be using a tool called ForeFlight to do a lot of the planning. Uh, I can do this by hand, but you guys would get really bored <laughs> seeing me do it by hand. Uh, but uh, we do have to know how to calculate all of this by hand in, for our check ride when we go through our, the examination with the uh, FAA. Anyhow, so I've put in my starting point, which is KEWN, that is New Bern. Destination, which is K um, Mike. Bravo Hotel, sorry, and um, it's down in the Outer Banks, or excuse me, that's in Beaufort, and um, my flight altitude that I would want to fly at, which is going to be 3,500, and then I let the system do some calculations. So it's now going to check the weather, and it's going to show me what the winds are like, and at various altitudes, so you can see there the wind speeds, and how they will affect my aircraft as I'm flying, depending on the altitude that I'm in. We also want to check the METARs. That's the that's weather information. That is something I can probably dive into in a different video, but that is something that pilots have to know how to interpret. Uh, segments is basically really bad weather. So is there a chance of tornadoes, chance of thunderstorms? No. And finally, but yet yeah, probably most important, is to read over all of the notums for not only your airport, which you probably are going to know what's going on at your airport, but definitely for the airport that you're about to fly to. Um, the notums will tell you uh, if, say, a runway has been taken out of commission because it's being paved, or if beacon lights aren't working, or if there's an obstruction in an unusual location that you put you know, like say for example a crane and uh, notums are in incredibly important to make sure that you always review them and know what's going on all right so with that being said here's we where microsoft flight simulator uh, has kind of pre-planned the flight however there's going to be a slight problem with the way the simulator does it so it's taking me from uh, new Bern's airport and as you can see i'm going to fly right over um a military airfield now generally speaking the military does not appreciate encroachment uh, on <laughs> their uh, their airspace so we're going to be taking a wide berth and staying well outside of uh, MCS um, new MCS Cherry Points um, class D airspace and their controlled airspace which basically just means we're going to be flying on the other side of the river before we turn and then head down to Beaufort. So I wanted to show you that very large uh, military airstrip. Uh, I, have a, I have a feeling if I got a little too close to him, I might have some Harriers uh, buzzing me to tell me to, <laughs> to, to bugger off. Uh, and then here is where our destination is. And uh, I like this airport's runway layout. It's, uh, you know, it's got a lot of different options depending on the prevailing winds. Uh, next thing I'm going to do here is I'm just looking at the the airspace and the most important thing to, that we have to, that we want to copy down before we go on our flight is we want to know the the airport and the airport diagram where the taxiways are. We also must know those frequencies and we need to know what class of airspace this is because if it is class DC or excuse me Delta Charlie or Bravo, we're going to be talking to a human in a tower we're going to have to establish communication prior to entering their airspace and there are other requirements that i will get into but like class b airspace there's a whole other slew of stuff that goes into that um also what i'm looking at here is this is an alert area so this is this zone has been basically flagged as like not okay to just willy-nilly fly into obviously it's around the military base not a big surprise it is labeled as a alert area meaning that the 
I could ask permission to fly through there and permission could be granted if they're not doing, say, any type of operations. There are also things called uh, military operation areas, which are similar. It basically just means that, hey, you know, the military might be flying and doing some maneuvers in this area. Check with us before you come in here to make sure that that's not, not going on. And we also want to see the the height of um of the class d airspace so um did i say d yeah class d airspace basically i can overfly a airport as long as i am above its controlled airspace so if the class d airspace goes up to say 1500 feet uh, i could overfly at 2500 and not have to speak to the tower and, and not run the risk of having an incursion into controlled airspace so with that being said, we're going to get right down to business and I'm going to speed things up for the sake of brevity. I'm going through my checklist like I would normally do. I wanted to treat this flight just as though I was doing an actual flight to this airport, but I realized that you, the viewer, might find it a little boring to see me go through all the items that us pilots have to do in our checklist. So you will notice that there's going to be some time acceleration in in various parts throughout this video just to try to make it shorter than um, the actual real-time flight. With that being said, I hope you guys will stick around and enjoy this video. It's, you know, it, it's something that is... It basically, these types of flights brings together everything that we learn in flight school. So, um, once you get into the phase where you are doing uh, cross countries, then you're really starting to integrate everything that you've spent the last year learning all together in in real life. And uh, you know, no no pressure, but um, you know, you're doing it. You know, so it's uh, really exciting, but it's also very important to do a lot of practice because uh, it's not something that you want to um, make any mistakes on. All right, so engine start successful. We're going to go ahead and quickly taxi. I contacted uh, New Bern Ground. They gave me clearance to taxi over to runway 22. As someone who is, flies at this airport all the time, they had me taxi in the Microsoft Flight Simulator, had me taxi the weirdest way possible. Um, I have never been told to taxi the way they recommended, and um, they literally had me taxiing out onto an active runway, which is not ideal, to say the least. I mean, some airports you have to do that because they, they don't have taxiways, but I've never been told to take this path to runway 22. There's a completely separate path on the other side of the runway that we always use. And, uh, yeah, that's, I wanted to point that out because uh, if you use the simulator, uh, ne don't ever think that the AI is going to do what really happens in real life. Uh, definitely when it comes to tower, I've had Microsoft Flight Sim ATC just do the strangest things. And, you know, in all my years of, of flying, I've never had some of the weird things that Microsoft Flight Sim will do. But hey, keeps me on my toes, right? You know, maybe I'll get that crazy, um, you know, I shouldn't say crazy. The tower operators are awesome. But maybe I get that tower operator who just feels the need to have me taxi down an active runway. You know, who knows? Or maybe I end up with somebody who just decides to change the active runway to being the opposite runway, you know, when I'm almost turning to final. Yeah, it could happen. Hopefully it never happens, but it could. So now I'm setting all of my radios, and this is basically just kind of thinking three steps ahead. So I'm setting... Next I'll be talking to Newburn Tower. Once I leave Newburn Tower's airspace, I'm going to be speaking to Cherry Point Approach, which they see large swaths of area and they provide what's known as flight following meaning that they will have me on their radar and they will ensure that other aircraft don't get too close or they will advise me if there's traffic getting close to me 
Cleared for takeoff runway 22 Cessna 4 Foxtrot Mike. And then in the secondary radio, I went ahead and set up my destination airport um, weather uh, information. And it does not have a tower. It is what's known as a unicom frequency, which means it's just a frequency that everyone in the vicinity should be on that same frequency listing the traffic but there's not a control there's not an air traffic controller that's i'm going to be talking to so i set the, the destination weather so i can get that easily and i set the frequency for when i um, am approaching and getting ready to land all just so that i don't have to worry about that while i'm flying all right so we've we were cleared for takeoff we did our takeoff roll Everything is looking good. We are climbing out. And my personal rule of thumb is to climb out at least till 700 feet before uh, breaking out of the pattern. That is not a written rule. It's just one of my instructors kind of hammered that into my, my mind. And um, since then, I see the value of in, in the safety of it because it just guarantees that the aircraft are moving in a predictable way. So... Now that I've hit 700, I am going to turn towards my destination, and Newburn Tower will let me know that I'm leaving their airspace, and that frequency change is approved here shortly. So as you may have picked up, the pre-flight is the most critical. Like you have to do it. Don't don't ever think that you know someone can just go flying or figure it out as they go along. That that is no 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 no. Um, you in aviation, everything needs to be as predictable as possible, so that in the event some strange occurrence happens, you can deal with that and not be overwhelmed by just what would be the normal uh, workload on a pilot. So pre-flight is so critical and planning where you're going to fly those, you know, to fly your route, um, like what I did there, programming in the frequencies prior to, um, you know, me actually taking off and flying the airplane. All of that work ahead of time sets me up for success and it allows a... It allows me to now focus on doing the most important part, and that is flying the airplane. So as much as, you know, there may be a false perception of the demands on a pilot, especially in the cruise phase of the flight, you know, now you hear about so much automation and autopilot. Well, no, no, just that the media lies to you. Um, you can give me all the autopilots in the world. You can try to automate, you know, as much as you want but at the end of the day the pilot in command is the one that's in charge of the airplane and just in general like you know autopilots and computers are nice but they're not to be trusted you know you you make sure that it's doing what you think it should be doing and if you detect any deviation you got to be engaged and be ready to take take the controls and and do you know what you need to do all right, so here I'm going to show you, show you my VFR map. That's just showing where the Cherry Point airspace is. So I'm crossing over the river to make sure I stay well outside of their airspace. Um, I'm also now going through my checklist here. So I've completed my, my um, ascent checklist, and now I've completed my cruise checklist. So the next one will be the descent checklist, which will be much later in the flight. So... Got that taken care of. Back to the map. You can see that that dotted line that goes around the... I'm, I'm staying right outside. My, that little white airplane there is me. And that dotted line there is Cherry Point's airspace. So I'm staying away from Cherry Point's airspace. I've already established communication with Cherry Point. They gave me um, a transponder code, which I punched in, which allows them to see me on their radar. So they, they know who I am. They know where I'm going. With that being said, I'm not going, you know, to run the risk of an incursion. Um, I, just, I know this is a little bit of a side tangent, but 
it is possible to do what's known as a as a transit through controlled airspace so if you needed to fly through um an airport like uh a medium-sized airport that's class c airspace but you just needed to go through it you aren't landing at the airport prior to entering their airspace you establish two-way communication and you can request transit through the airspace and it's up to the tower whether or not they want to allow you to do that they can grant it in which case then you can You can fly through that airspace with, you know, without it being an incursion as long as you get the okay. And also, don't be surprised if the air traffic controllers are already busy or they're under high workload. They're going to deny you. They, they don't want to deal with an extra airplane in their airspace. They're going to say, you know, request denied. And you just are going to fly around. <laughs> so, all right, we've cleared... Cherry Point's airspace, so now I'm going to turn toward my destination. Uh, very early on in the video, I went ahead and um, dialed in the heading that would take me directly to my destination. They called a bug, so I bugged in the heading for where I intend to go, and um, yeah, so that could be helpful. You can actually barely see it in the corner right there but now I'm going to be turning to the heading that will take me down to my destination of Beaufort so as, as my instructors told me at this phase here this is the part of the flight where you can finally breathe you can I mean you're obviously still actively flying the airplane but um this this is the cruise phase so this is when you get to actually look out the window remind yourself that you're flying an airplane and it's awesome <laughs> and enjoy the views as well as still you know monitoring all your gauges but it, this is your your breathing time you know this is this is the part of the flight where you can just you know take in the moment so to speak so that's why I'm looking to the left, looking to the right, and reminding myself, man, it is awesome to be up here flying. A little bit of a contrast. So during the takeoff phase of the flight, and really from taxi, so from engine start, taxi, all the way to takeoff, is considered a sterile phase of, of flight. So the, there should not be chatter um, amongst anyone inside the cabin. And that's very, very important when you have like a pilot, co-pilot. The initial phase is sterile, sterile cockpit, so there's no, no communication other than what's, what's important to fly the airplane. Similarly, when you get into descent and you start to move into landing, landing is a sterile cockpit as well. So no communication at all other than the critical things that need to be talked about in order to safely get the plane back on the ground and taking off is fun landing is the challenge there's a quote that says the second greatest thrill is flying the first greatest thrill is landing <laughs> because airplanes like to fly they they are made to fly convincing an airplane that it needs to return back to earth safely that's the tricky part so right now I'm just um, checking my comms so that those systems there are the radio slash GPS it's called a, it's German 430 and I think the top one is the 530 in my training aircraft I only have the 430 so I only have that smaller one on the bottom and um, I actually have a piece of flight uh, sim equipment that is a mock-up of that so that I can use it and emulate exactly what I would be doing in the cockpit.
So just enjoying the view again for a few moments. For Christmas, I've got a new video card, so I'm liking the uh, I'm liking liking the uh, frame rate and the extra level of quality that I can boost flight sim settings up to. If you don't have Microsoft Flight Simulator or you're thinking about getting Microsoft Flight Simulator, just know it's a resource hog. It is going to max out your GPU uh, as much as it can. I mean, it's probably one of the most intensive um, programs that you can run on on your computer. Not only just GPU, but also you know, CPU and everything because it's a simulator. So there's it's doing a lot of math and a lot of calculations to make this what you're seeing as accurate as real life as possible. And I will say props to them. I did a flight where uh, there was I did real time weather, and in my fourth flight, my weather briefing, it told me there was going to be a boatload of turbulence. And when I did the flight in the simulator, there was a boatload of turbulence. I was bumping and rolling and rocking and rolling. So. Um, all right, we are approaching the airport now, so I am going to go ahead and get on Unicom. I'm going to let them know my position, and, um, well, okay, excuse me. First, I'm going to check the weather, making sure that the winds are the way I want them, or the winds align with a runway that I want to land at, and I'm also making sure that my altimeter pressure setting hasn't changed, and now I have announced my intent to land on runway 8, and this is a graphical representation that's available in Microsoft Flight Simulator that shows you the traffic pattern. I don't use it often. Um, when I got the new video card, it, I think I reset a bunch of my settings to default. So normally I, ha I have this off, but it's, it's helpful. One thing I do want to point out, though, if you're ever flying, is see how it's saying too fast? It... Microsoft's interpretation of the speeds that you should be doing at various phases and what is taught to me in real life are two different things. So too fast can you know, you know basically eat, eat my short, so to speak, because too slow runs the risk of me stalling and falling out of the sky. Uh, having a little extra speed, no problem there. I can bleed that speed off. I can I can. I can handle that. And too, too fast, like the speed limit in controlled airspace is 250 knots. Okay, so that's, that's the FAA's like max speed. I'm not going 250 knots. So, all right, we are now in final approach, the most critical phase of the flight. And we are doing a nice controlled approach. We have a good rate of descent. And things are looking pretty good. We've got to maintain orientation on that center line. We're going to be using our throttle to basically cause us to descend quicker or to keep us aloft, just depending on, you know, how fast we're sinking. And there we go. So the target usually is that number. So that number eight is my aim point. And boom safely landed so now i'm going to apply brakes bring this uh this sweet cessna to a stop i'm gonna go ahead and retract my flaps that's something i could do when i get off the runway but i'm just used to immediately taking the flaps off and now i'm going to exit the one way folks i hope you enjoyed this uh, again this was a bit of a demonstration of a cross country if you're interested in kind of knowing more about this i could do like a deep dive or maybe go into more detail about specific phases of it um to make a bit of a shorter video if you stuck around to the end of this video thank you so much you rock you're awesome i hope that you enjoyed this um please if you have any questions comments or feedback feel free to, to leave me a comment i read all of them and if you like what you see give me a like if you 
might enjoy this type of content, feel free to subscribe. Um, takes me a, a good little bit of effort to do some of this video editing, and uh, every single person that watches these videos, uh, it really means so much to me because it makes uh, it makes these hours that I spend in video editing <laughs> worth it. So, folks, I thank you again, and I hope you guys have a great day, and I will see you in the next video.